We have all witnessed some pretty amazing things when it comes to technology in our lifetimes. Regardless of your age, you have seen how rapidly technology can evolve and how it's become a part of our everyday lives. For a quick little flashback, we're going to go to 1975. <laughs> now this is when IBM announced the new portable computer. Can you imagine this now? I couldn't help but picture this guy walking into Starbucks <laughs> with a new computer. Excuse me, sir, can you get the door? I'm going to work in here today. It's a new portable computer. And it's funny now, but a lot has changed since then. Think of the amount of power that we have now right at the tip of our hands. We have the ability to research anything at any time. We can purchase products. We can share our opinions with the entire world, whether they're true or not. We can control our home camera systems, sprinkler systems, even our lighting systems. We can track our physical activity throughout the day and our sleeping patterns at night. But did we get all of these amazing abilities and conveniences at no cost whatsoever to us? And unfortunately, the answer is no. See, there's another great saying, nothing in life is ever truly free. I remember getting my first free puppy. A few years later, looking at the vet bill after his surgery, kind of laughing to myself about what's the definition of free really meant. So what is the trade-off? What are we as everyday users giving up to have these amazing abilities? And the answer is pretty simple. It's our data and our privacy. In our world today, data is driving big businesses. It's driving their marketing, advertising campaigns, their new product developments, our investments. I'm going to share with you today a story about one of the biggest retailers and how they used our data. Now, collecting data is nothing new. Previously, birth records were just public information any company could get. They'd scrape the data, send coupons, advertisements, free trials, whatever it took to try to hook the customer at that perfect stage of the sales funnel. But now, teams have, companies have teams of predictive analysts combing through the massive amounts of data that they're collecting. Imagine being a parent of a teenage daughter and all of a sudden getting baby coupons in the mail addressed to her. Well, in one case, this actually happened. They were able to figure out that a female was pregnant before the father did. See, a man named Andrew Pohl, a statistician for Target, and his team of analysts were able to determine that about in the first beginning stages of the second trimester, women were typically buying more unscented lotion products. The other team members noticed in the next beginning 20 weeks that they would stock up on additional supplements like magnesium, calcium, zinc. Now many people were buying, researching all these types of products, but together it started to form a pattern. And if it was a female, they were able to tell, based on the type of purchases, they could assign a pregnancy predictive score with very high likelihood that the female was pregnant and could also narrow down the time frame of her due date to a very specific window. In this case, they nailed it. They were actually able to figure it out and send coupons to the daughter before the father even knew she was pregnant. Now that's pretty powerful, right? And for the most part, we all have devices like smartphones, smart watches, an iPad, or even an e-reader. And all of these devices are connected to the internet. And that's what makes up the internet of things. Now the definition is any computing device that's embedded in an everyday object that can send and receive data. By 2020, Gartner Research suggests that there will be about 20 billion of these devices online. So these devices are online, they have the ability to send and receive data, but do you think the same amount of security considerations are going into all of them? Unfortunately not. 
it doesn't really make a lot of sense to put anti-malware, antivirus on a $10 smart light bulb in your home. Or supply security updates or patches to the bootleg e-reader that you bought off of eBay. So we have a growing number of these devices coming online. They can send and receive our data. And some of them just lack basic security features. I know, I promise you this is not the next terrible sci-fi movie coming out this summer. But unfortunately, this is a true story, and this happened at a major university. About 5,000 smart devices, consisting of some light bulbs and vending machines, were hacked. They were infected with malware They did a pretty simple request. It went online every 15 minutes and did a search for seafood. Pretty harmless. But when 5,000 devices all connect at the same time and look up something, it essentially caused this network to crash, making it unavailable for everybody on the campus and could not get on the internet. So imagine if this happened at a hospital, for example. Imagine the impact that that would have. If a doctor was with a patient and it was a life-saving situation where they needed to get into a medical record, what if the network was unavailable? What would happen? So now this specific attack was pretty harmless. It could have been a larger plan or a, a scope of concept for the attackers. But typically when these events occur, there's a bigger picture and it always leads into some sort of financial gain. And this is where we're kind of moving into the world today. And this is exactly where the newest threat came from, ransomware. Does everybody remember when it was just viruses we had to worry about? You'd accidentally go to a sketchy site, click on something, and then you get hit with pop-up after pop-up after pop-up. Incredibly annoying, but at the end of the day, it was pretty harmless compared to the threats we have today. Well, over the last five to 10 years, we've become immune to hearing about all the security breaches that are happening, whether it be LinkedIn, Yahoo, or even healthcare facilities. In 2015 alone, the Office of Civil Rights said that 253 healthcare facilities were hacked, which led to about 112 million stolen records. So now, the black market is essentially saturated with all of our data. In 2012, when a medical record was going for about $50 on the black market, the value of it now is about a dollar. So think about it if you were a legitimate business and your profit margins just disappeared like that. You'd either have to evolve or just shut your doors. And unfortunately, the cyber criminals have evolved. These are no longer computer guys sitting in their mother's basements in the dark, chugging Mountain Dews, playing video games all night. These are intel incredibly intelligent entrepreneurs. And they're evolving into this business model. NBC reported in 2016 that the ransomware business alone would net $1 billion. This is the newest billion dollar industry. They have full-blown call centers now that will gladly assist you in paying your ransom. They'll allow you to donate a part of it to your favorite charity. You can get a discount by spreading it through your contact list for some of the people you might not really care about. According to Symantec, in 2016, the average price paid for a ransom was about $679. That's pretty good, right? But why should the cyber criminals do all the work? Well, some have evolved into a ransomware as a service business model. So you can join the community, spread rans ransomware, and get a commission. How about an 80% commission? Anybody out there pay your sales team 80% commission? No. But why would they pay so much? It's because there's so many other companies doing and evolving to this model, they're remaining competitive. I cannot count the amount of times I hear, 
Nobody wants to hack me. I'm just a small business. I don't have any information that they would want. The problem is, they don't care who you are. They don't know who you are. It's automatic scripts running online, just searching for vulnerabilities. It's not targeted to you personally, and they will never know who you, who you are. It's automatic. It can happen to anybody at any time. So what can we do? Luckily, we don't have to go back to college to get a degree or read all the books that I've read. Whether you have a Windows or a Mac device, you should always verify your security updates. Typically, these vulnerabilities are looking for known patches that are already released. And that's all they're doing. It's a known patch. Just update your computers as frequently as possible. Make sure your antivirus and anti-malware is up to date. And assume the worst in email. Never click on something you're unsure about. If the email is coming from somebody and you think it's out of character, give them a call or don't click on anything. Always change the default password when you get a new device. Mailware spreads by checking for a vulnerability and then checking for the default username and password. This is the most simplest thing that we can do to protect ourselves and it's the most efficient against these types of attacks. Always back up your data, no matter what. And then back up the backup. If it's important to you, you can afford a $100 hard drive. Trust me. Most of us use one password or a variation of it. Don't save it in a notepad or a sticky note or an Excel spreadsheet. Go online and get a password locker. It's encrypted, it's secure, and it'll cost you less than $20 a year. So now almost all of us have embraced these evolving technologies into our daily lives. But we need to also recognize the power that we all have now. And it's truly up to us to take the responsibility to protect our data and ourselves. Thank you.